I was like a bird in the light with a broken wing mid a broken man city would carry me in Welcome to episode three of Leaving Egypt. This is a place where I tell my stories and I share my thoughts on leaving spiritual oppression um, that we find every day in our lives and that we all experience and choosing liberty and freedom um, with God's help. So just a quick recap. In the Bible, it talks about the Israelites who are God's chosen people. They're enslaved in Egypt for centuries, and then eventually God leads them out of their slavery and into the wilderness and then into the promised land eventually. And the big goal is not necessarily getting them out of the slavery physically, but it's getting the slavery out of them, retraining their minds, retraining their brains. And for me, my story is I had a failed marriage and I've also suffered with autoimmune illness um, for a decade almost that I'm aware of. And that has brought a lot of oppression on me as well as a lot of other things in my life. But those are kind of like the main overarching themes as well as being bullied when I was younger. And um, the hardest part after coming out of all that was retraining my brain. And something really exciting happened recently, um, which is why this episode is called Excelling at Peace. I will get into that soon. But first, I want to share the ripple effect that God has in a time of liberation. It spreads and it permeates to other people. When I left my marriage, my dad came with me to West Virginia, which is where we were at the time. And I was going through so much, obviously, packing up my boxes and just going through so much pain. And, you know, the issue in my marriage uh, that was so obvious was my ex-husband suffered with PTSD and then he coped with alcohol. And that was really hurtful on me. And it was tough to watch. It was tough to experience. My dad came and, and of course, my dad just wants my pain to go away. And he made a statement like, I can't believe he hasn't quit by now. Or, you know, he made some sort of judgment. And I snapped back at him and I said, Dad, you're no different. And he knew what I was talking about. My dad, his whole life, his mom died when he was nine, I think, and he went to marijuana, and he's been a habitual user ever since, and it's been really tough on my parents' marriage. Marijuana does not manifest in the same way as alcohol with cruelty. I was talking, um, I think it was episode number one, about how addictions and certain substances carry personalities and they carry certain effects that, that it comes with. And don't let one fool you over the other. They're all meant to blind you. They're all meant to keep you sleeping so that you miss your purpose and you sleep and you miss out on what you were supposed to do. And your light that you have and your calling and who you are in your original design is a threat to the devil. And that is why addiction is so prevalent because it's his tool that he can use um, in addiction with many things. I'm talking like it could be food, it could be diet, it could be porn, it could be, you know, drugs, anything. And that addiction keeps you enslaved. And we can talk in a different episode if anybody's interested in in hearing a little bit more about my thoughts on addiction and what that that has been for, for me. But, um, you know, I've seen it play out in my parents' marriage. And it turned into a lot of secrecy, you know, because it caused issue. And so then my dad would like go hide it. And my mom just wouldn't want to hear about it, but she would feel a disconnect. Um, she would feel that he wasn't available because he's not, he's numbed out. Like, I don't care what anybody says. I know that alcohol is culturally acceptable. I know weed now is definitely culturally acceptable. And there was a time when like I smoked and there was a time when I drank. I can't now because of health issues, either one. Um, And so I'm not saying this as like this self-righteous person. I'm saying this from 
just my life. Like I'm speaking my truth and alcohol, weed, it numbs you and don't let anybody fool you on that. But it played out in my parents' marriage and it didn't affect me consciously. I think it did subconsciously because I, I felt, you know, maybe there was a disconnect, like, like my dad wasn't emotionally available, but yet he was physically available to me and he did a ton of stuff with us, like took us camping and did all these incredible things. Like I have really good memories from my childhood. Um, it's funny how it, it affects kids in different ways, like different personalities and and all of that. There's so much to that. But nonetheless, it wasn't a good thing. And I got to see a beautiful marriage play out, but I got to see some humanity too. Um, it was still a healthy marriage, but I think my dad worked hard at that because it would be easy to let it take over. I think he was constantly managing it. Like he would explain to me, like once I left my ex-husband and learned so much about addiction, like I went to AA meetings, I went, I read books, I read I learned so much about what it was I just went through for all those years and what I was going through currently um, in getting over that and healing from that and wrapping my head around it. My dad was a huge support during that time because he had experience in addiction. So he was just a good resource for me. But he explained that you're constantly managing it. You're constantly, when am I going to get my next one? How am I going to hide it from this person? Um, You know, you're you're constantly thinking about it. I mean, honestly, it's kind of like me and coffee. Like I have autoimmune illnesses. And so there's all these food sensitivities I have. And I miss coffee so bad. And I can do it occasionally. But I'm just like, every day I wake up and I'm like, oh my gosh, it'd be so nice to have some coffee. It'd be so nice to have some coffee. It's like, that's you know, or if I'm having coffee, anyway, it's, it's just this cycle where you're managing it and you're spending your time managing it. And that's, that's the focus. That's what it becomes. And it, that's why it turns people selfish because it is self-centered. You're constantly thinking about how to get your next high or your next buzz or your next fix. Like that's not freedom. It's a counterfeit false feeling of satisfaction and feeling of like exhilaration but that's not the freedom God intended I think we think of freedom as like being able to do whatever we want but it's like I think the real freedom he's talking about comes with like the fruits of the spirit which are peace love joy self-control Uh, That doesn't sound very fun, does it? But yet it's life-giving. Those are the only things that are going to bring you life and not death. Everything else is an illusion of, of freedom, but it doesn't bring you life. It's fake freedom. Keeps keeps you sleeping. Keeps you numb from real freedom that actually fuels your soul. Actually helps you grow. Actually helps you permeate onto other people the light that you were designed to give to other people. So those are my thoughts on that. Recently, I, you know, I'm living here in Nashville and I'm pursuing my music and I'm, I've got these songs that I've, I've been releasing and I've got this album coming up and I did this Kickstarter and I raised all this money to be able to market my album. And because I believe in the message and I believe in the things God's taught me and I just want to share it. I just want to share it and hope that somebody benefits from it. So, you know, America is a culture of do, 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 do. Like if you work 40 hours a week, you're, you're rare. Most people work way more than that. In Canada, they work 35 hours a week and they require three weeks off during the year. Here it's 40 hours a week minimum, two weeks off. I mean, that is, I know we're supposed to work and I know we're supposed to do. And I guess for the lazy person, that's a good thing. But I personally don't struggle with laziness. I struggle with doing too much, overexerting myself. And I think a lot of you are probably the same. Like I'm a very driven person. And so that can be a trap in itself. My narrative growing up, as a little girl, um, I was bullied severely. 
Um, and I was always told that I was never enough. And I was always made to feel uncool. I wasn't enough. I was a goody two shoes. I was just whatever. And as a kid, and I talked about this in episode two, your emotional intelligence isn't there. So you believe it. You believe whatever you're told. So if you grew up in a bad household, you're going to believe whatever they say. And I grew up with a good household, but I was bullied and I believed what she said and we were best friends too. So it was like this close relationship. And so from then on, that was my narrative and I did musical theater and I did a ton of auditions and like all these different things that put me on the stage, which just fed into that narrative more of what do people think of me? Am I enough? And so I was constantly proving subconsciously that I'm enough. Am I enough? I'm enough. Am I enough? I'm enough. And it was just all the time. And I, and I started realizing that I had this issue. And I think so many of us do, but you know, in my twenties and, um, I knew that in the marriage and everything too. And, um, at that point, you know, I was in an unhealthy marriage and I was struggling, um, with my health and my line of work was like nonprofit work, which you do not get enough money like they are not paid enough and then I eventually got my teaching degree which also is not enough money um and so many times we equate our value with money value and that is like the opposite of the truth like God says those who are rich will have a harder time (laughs) getting to me getting to heaven but I think what he means is getting to me like because that's such a facade and it can be such a an idol that you miss God but when you're poor you're desperate. So you call on God. So I think those who are poor are humble. Um, and so anyway, I struggled with, with that narrative and, um, you know, I wasn't valued in my marriage for really who I was. And I know he was, he was trapped too. Like he was working out his own stuff and there wasn't room for me. (laughs) And, um, this was just something we had to learn together addiction keeps both people trapped in a cage. And, um, so I'll get back to that in a second, but you know, this episode is called excelling at peace. And my song that inspired this talk here is called Canary. And this is the third single that I've released off my new album. I was explaining, you know, what I was going through at the time to a friend who was an author and she said, honey, it sounds like you are a canary in a coal mine. And I said, what does that mean? And she said, back in the day, they used to take canaries in a cage and bring them into the coal mine when they would mine. And when the canary started to die, that was their cue to leave because the mine had too much poison in it. The mine was toxic, so they needed to get out. So the canary was the guinea pig. And the canary, of course, didn't have a say in any of this. I felt like I didn't have a say, like I felt trapped. And when you're, you're trapped, it's like, you don't think there's a way out. And somebody said to me once when I was in the marriage, you are never trapped. And I said this in the first episode, you are never trapped. You always get to decide, like you have the power. There's nothing that says you have to stay in something. You get to change your mind. Like God gives us free will. He gives us grace he gives us I mean he knows this life is tough like that doesn't phase him he just wants you to seek him you know and like we're gonna make mistakes we're gonna make the wrong choice but he's still gonna be with you whether you're making the right choice or the wrong choice in my marriage and with that addiction that was present I was encaged he was encaged and as I've left I've had to undo that slavery thinking. I've had to undo some of the thought patterns that I learned from being codependent in that relationship. But the story continues. I'm still leaving Egypt in my own personal ways that happened way before him. Yes, he may have contributed, but these are things I'm working through from before him, like the narrative of not being enough. And recently, you know, I've got this podcast that I started, I've got this book that I'm going to be writing about all the miracles and signs and wonders and cool things that God did for me 
that I touch on in this podcast, but I wanted to write it down too. I've got my album. I've got, you know, all these things. Then I've got my day job. I walk dogs for a living here in Nashville. It's awesome. I could not teach and do music at the same time. So I'm constantly torn between needing to do all these things, needing to do all these things. So I I never feel like what I'm doing will be enough. I never feel like I'm doing enough. I never feel like there's enough time in the day to do everything I want to do. So I get so stressed out about doing everything perfect that it takes away the joy of doing it. And part of of your purpose is to experience joy while doing it and peace while doing it. Like God's not asking you to do something that's going to stress you out all the time. So I get so caught up sometimes in focusing on my purpose and my calling and following that, that I lose the truth that my purpose is to be. (laughs) My purpose is to be. I was telling my friend this recently and she said, yeah, we're human beings, not human doings. And it's so true. Who we are is enough because of who we come from and because of who is inside of us. And what's really cool is if Christ is inside of us, the word Christ actually means is sufficient, is enough. You are enough. By definition, (laughs) you're enough. And so I had this this thought of um, we only get one life. And I know for a fact we only get one life as who we are right now. So this is my only life to be Alex maybe. To have the family I had. To have the friends I have. To have the story I have. The gifts I have. To experience life through my eyes. This is the only life I get. I don't get another one. I don't get to be 31 again with this turnaround story of I'm engaged to this incredible man that I grew up with. We were friends since we were babies and God brought us back together when we were 30 and he just proposed to me and we're getting married in a year. Like I don't get that again. I don't get to experience this again. This is a sweet time in my life. You know, some of you might be wanting, you might be single and you might be wanting to be married or whatever it is you're yearning for, just know good things are coming, but where you're at right now, you might miss later. So soak it in, take it in, and make the best of it. I think, you know, I'm a perfectionist, and so I want my healing to come so bad. I've struggled with autoimmune illnesses, and I want my healing to come so bad that I do everything I possibly can to to make that happen, to do everything on my part. And then God does the rest. But I think I get so caught up in doing everything myself that I don't leave room for God sometimes. Um, But I get so caught up on doing the perfect thing that I forget that it's better to do something inadequately, but with peace. Give yourself permission to have peace. Then do it perfectly and be stressed out because God can work with inadequate. He can't work with perfection because there's no room for him. Be inadequate. Do what you can. Set boundaries for yourself. You know, yes, tonight I'm probably going to work till midnight, but that's because I cheated and I had some coffee today, but that's okay. On the other days when I'm not going to have coffee, I'm going to go to bed earlier. I'm going to stop working. I'm not going to be hard on myself for being depressed, whatever. Like, it's okay to give yourself a break. Stop working, you know. Be inadequate because that's that's where you're giving the rest to God to work in your life. And you're giving him room to work and get the glory. Because if you did it perfectly, you would get all the praise. God needs the praise. 
because that's what's life giving. Like if you get all the praise, somebody's going to idolize you. You're going to idolize you. Put yourself on this pedestal and it's going to rob somebody and it's going to rob you of an experience to be carried, an experience to be covered in God's peace, an experience to surrender to God and let him show you how life-giving that is. It's not because he's egotistical and he wants the glory. Like, he wants to take the load off you. And it's a good thing, so let's celebrate it. Let's praise him for it. That's what it's all about. So, I had this thought, I'm such a doer. I'm an exceller. So what if I made my goal? to excel at peace, give myself permission to excel at peace. Now that's something I have not done. That's a challenge I have yet to overcome. So I'm still learning how to do that, but I think it's a word for somebody. And that's why I wanted to do this episode. I talked to my friend and she said, oh my gosh, slow mints taking in the moments, going slow, appreciating the moments for what they are. If a person's going slow in front of you, laugh about it. Like this is the human existence. This is being on earth. Like we get to experience all these things. Like I have a feeling it's way cooler than we think it is because we're used to it. So let's all together just challenge ourselves and take in the moments have the slow mints, mark them down, wake up and say, I never get today again. I never get to wake up and be 31 and engaged and working on my passions. No, I don't know the answer. No, I don't know the outcome. These are things that we just have to give ourselves grace. Like if you're a perfectionist like me, like I am so hard on myself. So if you are hard on yourself and you're a perfectionist and you you have self-discipline? Like, I know I have self-discipline. Give yourself a break. Allow God to work in your imperfection and your inadequacies, because he will, and it's going to be awesome. So back to the story of my dad before we end. Well, when he came to West Virginia to help me pack up my stuff and leave to recap He had said something to the effect of judging my ex-husband or my husband at the time and for his alcoholism. And I said, dad, you are no different. And it convicted him because he had been addicted to marijuana his whole life. And some people say you can't be addicted to marijuana. You can talk to him. And they've also not done long-term studies on it. It creates anxiety in people long-term. And I think that we're going to see this in about 20 to 30 years. Um, he experienced all of that. So he's in the hotel room that night, the last night that I had there. And he's looking out the window and, and he was going to drink a beer. He doesn't have an issue with drinking, but he was going to drink a beer. And then he thought, you know what? I need to be present for this. This is a battle. This is a spiritual warfare. At that point, God had been giving dreams and signs and visions. And I mean, it was just, it was a war. It really was for me to leave and the doubts I had and the back and forth and all this stuff. Anybody that's gone through divorce knows what I'm talking about. So he decided he needed to stay energetically present with what was going on and really be available for me and for God to speak. If God was going to speak to him, anything to help me. That's a good father. It really is. So he's looking out the window. And of course I had already said what I said to him about you're no different. And he sees the sunset and it is red, like red, like strikingly fire red and then white in the distance of a cloud, like red and white. And the whole theme was leaving Egypt. God gave my husband at the time the dream about how I left Egypt. I left the pyramid When we left West Virginia, we read a sign that said, you are now leaving Egypt. I mean, there were so many things about leaving Egypt. And when Moses led the Israelites in the Bible out of Egypt, 
they went into the wilderness and it said that they were led by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day to know that the Lord was with them. That's what he saw in the sky. And it was just another picture of he's bringing us to the promised land. He's bringing us to freedom. And I knew and believed he was also bringing my husband at the time to freedom. It just wasn't going to be with me. But I was going to play a part in his healing. I was entrusting my husband to God at this point. God said, I know how to handle him. Give him to me. I've got him. I'm not going to let him go. So my dad's in the hotel room looking at the sky and it is just filled with the presence of God. He had never felt the Holy Spirit before. And maybe some of you listening haven't either or don't know if you have. Um, But he felt this overwhelming presence and it just overtook him. And he'll never forget the feeling. He probably tell the story way better than me. But since that moment, he was freed of his addiction. He was freed of marijuana. He has not touched it since. It's been almost four years. Seeing his daughter go through what I went through in the face of addiction and on the receiving end of addiction and really looking at himself for what he had engaged in and seeing what that had done and seeing what that really means and what spirit is really attached to that and and that the whole goal is to keep you sleeping so you miss your purpose because your life is a threat to the devil. If you are a living human, living and breathing, doesn't matter if you're sick, doesn't matter if you're addicted to cocaine, doesn't matter anything, you are still a threat because your life, your life, every moment, that you breathe and you're living, life beat death. Life beat death. Life is bigger than death. Life and love and light, they are the masters. God is the master. Every day, every second, over every cell, as long as you're alive, he is. And even when you're you're not alive, he's got you. But if you think about it, like, I remember that realization came to me like a couple years ago. Life conquers death every single second. You are a threat. Don't ever forget it. And God and the devil is going to use every way possible that he can to get you to sleep, get you to numb out, get you distracted from God's voice because he doesn't want to know what you're capable of. If you're operating in the will of God and if you're aligned with him and if you're channels are open and you know your worth and you know what power you have here I mean seriously the Holy Spirit when Jesus rose from the dead he delivered the Holy Spirit to us to use that is him in us and we get to do all the things that Jesus did we just have a lot of blockages and that's part of what this podcast is is like talking about getting those blockages out getting the the spiritual oppression and the emotional oppression out so that we can be more in line with our original design, which is so powerful and so beautiful. Um, but I'm so proud of my dad. He's been sober. Um, I don't know if you'd say sober for marijuana. He's been free of <laughs> marijuana for a while. And um, the cool, cool thing is, is that his withdrawals weren't even bad. And before when he tried to quit, they were hell. And he doesn't even crave it. He's starting, he has trained his brain, but this is the grace of God. He said prayer was a huge part of that. He would just pray, pray it away. And God kept him like that was what my dad could do. So my dad did his part and God did the rest. And, um, so I just think that's a real testament to somebody and, and, um, just the fact that when you make a brave decision and you're listening to God and you act that out in your life, the people around you are going to, it's going to propel them to do the same. Like you have a lot of power. So Lord, um, I just pray tonight that um, everybody listening, that you teach them how to excel at peace, that they find their worth and their purpose in being and being a child of you and let that be enough 
and teach us what true freedom means, not a facade freedom. Help us discern the difference. Give us the courage to follow your voice as you lead us into the promised land in all, all the ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining. See you next time. I was like a bird in the light with a broken wing amid a broken man said he would carry me and we went into the dark. I was like a prize and we were going deep in the mind. I might be hell, but I ain't the sun. If that's what you want, set me free, set me free. This is marriage, little bird I would tip toe in a shadow With a broken wing that never could heal yeah. I said, I'm a P.L. But I ain't the sun If that's what you want, set me free So numb to a heart